Welcome to chapter two, where we start talking about the neuron. The big question here is, is it possible, and how is it possible, that the neuron serves as the basic unit of all of cognition? Cognition is just so immense and complicated, and you know, all of our thoughts, everything we dream, uh, emotion, reasoning, planning, all these things that we do, how could it possibly be the case that that's all supported by this kind of scraggly little cell? It's really fundamentally just a cell, much like any other cell in your body. Uh, how is it possible that it actually supports all of everything that goes on in your brain, which is really all of you? It's just mind blowing. Let's start by thinking about what is in the cell, what's in the neuron. We have a cell body, and that's where the nucleus is, and literally all the same biological machinery that's in every other cell in your body. The neuron receives thousands of synaptic inputs onto its dendrite, which is a branching tree-like structure. It literally means tree. Um, those signals come in to the cell body. It integrates that information and sends it back out the axon in the form of action potentials. This is the basic biology of the cell. You probably know this already. Okay, so that's the biology of the cell, but what is it doing functionally? What does it actually compute? And here we can think in terms of something like a detector, which is like a smoke detector, uh, any other kind of signal detection kind of system. And essentially those Dendritic inputs coming in through the synapses um, are integrated and this signal that gets sent out reflects the extent to which the neuron has detected some kind of interesting signal out there in the world. And that's fundamentally what the neuron does. And it fires an action potential or an output through this axon whenever the signal exceeds some critical threshold. The question we are facing is how do we turn that process of integrating all these inputs, uh, computing, comparing them to the threshold and producing the output, how does that produce some kind of useful computation? How does that support even a tiny fraction of what our brains do? What's really going on? And here, it's actually useful to start with a very intuitive paradigm uh, developed by Oliver Selfridge in the 50s um, that is based on this idea of demons, uh, anthropomorphic representation of neurons, um, where they're basically detecting these patterns coming in. So you have image demons that are sort of receiving the external stimuli from the outside world. And then feature demons, as you can kind of see with these little pieces of paper, are detecting certain individual feature elements from those visual inputs. And then cognitive demons are putting together combinations of those individual feature elements to try to recognize complete letters in this case, or numbers. So R, A, B, et cetera, are different combinations of those individual line segment elements. Now normally, when I teach this class live, I just split up everybody in the class and have them actually enact this little neural network, this little cognitive system uh, in actual human kind of demons. You guys in the class end up being our little demons. Um, and what's especially nice about that is that the cognitive demons end up turning around and not seeing the stimuli that we're seeing, we're presenting to the front of the class. And that gives you a really powerful sense of how blind neurons really are, and we'll return to that in a little bit. So, uh, but it actually is a very reasonable picture, this kind of classic uh, pandemonium model of what actually happens in the brain. So now we know, with the benefit of a lot of neural recording studies, that in fact area V1, the primary visual cortex, receives some kind of visual image here. We're looking at somebody else's face coming in through the eyeball, and you're seeing uh, the features of that face on individual neurons in V1 in code, oriented line elements. 
we know a heck of a lot in detail about the neural representations in V1, and they really are just these basic kind of feature demons. And it's a massive part of your brain. There's, you know, just essentially a, you know, a different neuron representing a different orientation, uh, also color tuning, etc. in each little location of your retina. Um, it's really a massively parallel um, feature coding of the visual field. Then in V2, the next level up in the primary visual pathways, um, you end up with these neurons that do encode more complex combinations of features. So you have these kind of junction detectors like T detectors and L detectors, um, just like that were envisioned in the pandemonium model. Uh, then in layer four, the process continues. It's a little bit harder to really say exactly what the layer four representations look like, but they're certainly more complex than what you see in V2, such that by the time you end up in IT, which is very conveniently named IT, that's where IT is represented, that's where you have object rep representations. This is actually infratemporal cortex. Um, you have representations of actual people, faces, um, objects of all sorts. Um, you have very high level representations and these are the things that you can actually act on in the world and even higher levels of anterior areas of temporal cortex have even more higher kind of categorical abstract semantic knowledge. Uh, for example, nice people and mean people and males and females and uh, somebody who might owe you money, etc. These are really the, the categories that help you drive behavior. So fundamentally, a recurring theme that we're going to talk about a lot is that this hierarchical kind of deep processing, and again, this is really the same thing that current artificial intelligence systems are exploiting, this many, many layers of processing allow the system to extract really behaviorally useful representations at the high levels, just from building up incrementally, step by step, um, these more and more complex detectors. And when you see this kind of picture, you kind of think, okay, well, yeah, I guess if you just have a ton of these really simple detectors and you arrange them in just the right way, maybe you could actually end up detecting really important high level concepts. And maybe that's really what's going on in the brain. We are kind of able to abstract away from the details of the world and encode the world in these high level concepts. And that's what these hierarchies of simple detectors can do. So like in many situations in the world, uh, you take a very complicated problem and you break it down into a bunch of really, really simple steps. And by having many, many neurons, each doing a very simple part of the task and all working together, you end up solving the big problem. And again, we see the same solution in society um, you have something very complicated like building an atomic bomb or uh, building a highway or building a building, anything. Um, you, anything that gets constructed by people is the work of many people working together, but each uh, playing some basic role solving part of the problem. You get something out of the end that is much bigger than what any of the individual components are doing to solve the problem. And so that's really the same concept of emergence, that we have individual simple computations that build and produce high level cognition. And fundamentally, we think you can actually do everything you need, uh, more or less, as far as we know, with this basic process of detection.